Hi, it's Laval Brewer with South County Outreach, and I am excited to be here with Ed. All right, Laval, I'm excited to have you here too. We've been trying to get this on the calendar for a while, and we had it on, and then probably I got sick and things came up, but uh, we're finally here on a Friday afternoon. It's good to good to communicate with you, and and uh, you know it's always fun to see you in person, like we did the other day. But I'll take a Zoom call if that's what, if that's what I get. So. Laval and I have known each other, known of each other for many, many years, known each other for a short period of time, I think. We've passed each yeah. other in events over the years, pre-COVID, post-COVID, if there is such a thing as post-COVID, you know. There is. Post-pandemic, anyway. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. much we know. Um, yeah. Laval joined South County Outreach, and he'll tell us in a moment a little bit more about what that is, in June of 2020. So an interesting time to be joining um, a foundation that does what you do. I'm eager to hear more about that. Yeah. He's worked in the nonprofit sector for over 30 years, spent 20 years early in his career with the YMCA. I know you have great things to say about that. And I love, I read an article about you where you said that you think everybody trying to get started in the nonprofit sector should spend some time at the YMCA. So I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into that with you. Uh, sure. And in, in 2023, the year we're, or, well, actually, I guess that was last year now, uh, named to Orange County's 125 most influential people in Orange County. So that that's pretty exciting. And I would I would agree with what I know about you. So Laval, it's good to see you. Welcome to the From the Heart podcast, which is presented by the First Bank Center for Family Owned Businesses, where I also am fully employed. So good to see you, my friend. Good to see you also. And uh, I think the last time we were supposed to meet, it wasn't that you got sick. It was that you were doing the thing that's important that we talk about really regularly. You were taking care of family. Hey, I think I had a grandson that might have been sick. Yes. We were, yeah, there was a, a grandchild yeah. involved there. So, well, he is he is much more important than I ever will be. And, well, uh, <laughs> any excuse to spend time with the grand grandkids, I'm going to take that excuse. But uh, as, as you should. So, well, we're, we're here today. So, I'm going to start where I where I ended on the introduction about being, and not not to embarrass you and talk about the award of being, you know, one of 125 most influential people in Orange County. But let's focus on that word influence. When you think of that word influence, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you, wherever your mind goes with that word? You know, it, that's a great question. Um, and I've actually semi thought about it, but not fully thought about it till now you've, you've presented it to me. It's one thing to do good work. And by the way, we all should do good work. Sure. You know, we're, we're actually, I'm reading, a, I'm listening to a, a Bible study right now that talks about, and it's in a section where it's talking about, uh, do good work and God calls you to do good work, right? Like it, it, you're called to do this. It's not that God calls you to take away from the work you're doing right now and go somewhere else and do good work. It is do good work where you are. You can obviously go somewhere else and do good work too, yeah. but but it's, it's, that influential piece is not about doing good work. It's, it's about influencing people and influencing the cause or the work that you're doing for good. Right. Because it's really easy to influence people for gain, <laughs> for um, for for reward, for prestige, for you know, you, whatever it is that we we would indulge ourselves in or bring us you know wealth or fame or whatever it may be. But to influence people or influence others for good, that's a that's a totally different connotation because the for good often is not for you. Right. <laughs> Yeah, right. For the, right. for the general good, for the good, for the greater good. Right. Yeah. And sometimes when you have to influence for good, you may be you may be asking someone to give up something or give or, or step away from something that is beneficial to them, but is not good for others. And I take that pretty seriously, that there are times when what I what I battle for or I encourage people to do is to be an engagement to help others who are less fortunate than you, who often are no, not much different than you, often not different than you, to be successful. Hmm. So that's where I I use my influence, and I use it pretty regularly. I use it pretty wide. I don't use it just in my office with my team, although I I wield it very I wield it only when necessary. Yeah. Um, we, we, we only provide, we provide the guidelines for people to do that work. But then if I needed in, to influence, I only influence when I have to at off at the office, outside the office, I'm constantly sharing what I think is important for us to do based upon what I, my beliefs, which is 
how do we help everyone in our community be as successful as they possibly can from where they are to where they hope to be? Yeah, I like that. I, 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 as you're talking, I'm thinking about the two different types of influence. There's the intentional influence. You say, I only influence in the office or in this situation. But there's also just the unintentional. The, you're an influence whether you know it or not. People are watching you. And I'm not talking just about you, Laval, or you, Ed, but you, the general person who's watching or listening to this conversation, all of us, we're influencing people around us all day long, whether we know it or not. You know, our, our actions, our words, how we drive, how we talk to other people, how we respond in situations is influencing people. So yeah, there's a, there's a great responsibility when you're put in a position of influence, like you are as a CEO and president of, of South County Outreach, but also just the unintended influence when you walk into a room at an event and people are looking at you and you don't even know they're looking at you. So I think we're influencing all the time. So whether you're intentionally doing it or not, I know you have a massive influence. So, yeah, you know, I'll tell two stories. One that you probably wouldn't think I was going to talk about. Not not that you wouldn't think I think you have right. amazing character and education. But Charles Antis, when I, yep. we were talking recently, we, we talk a lot, but we were we talking did. recently. And he, he talked about how one day I was in a room and he was in a room. And it was a large room with a lot of people. And he and he looked at he looked and he goes, who's that guy? And it was something about the inter interactions I was having with people, which for me, when I'm seeing people, I go up, I'm giving them a hug, I'm gonna, and, 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 and you know that that that's that's fraught lately. But <laughs> yeah. give people a hug. I, I you know I'm and I'm introducing myself. I'm looking people in the eye. I'm I'm talking to people, and he he felt this energy from the engagement at that day. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna flip that into this conversation. You asked about the YMCA. I'm gonna flip yeah. this into that conversation. I remember one of my one of my executives, uh, Eric Mann. He's the CEO of uh, YMCA right now in Florida. I can't remember the Florida name, or else I would mention it specifically. He made it very clear to me as a young program director of the YMCA that I am representing the organization constantly. Yeah. There is no time when I'm not representing the organization. And he didn't say that because he was he was rebuking me or counseling me. He was just sharing with me. Reminding you that you were always. Reminding me that. Yeah. Like you, you were always yeah. when you're in public representing. At the same time, he was also hinting at as a black man in a neighborhood or in a community where there's not always this this uh for for the community a clear picture representation of a black man who is successful and who is doing the right work in the community. We often hear these other stories Yeah, that my responsibility to, to, to that cause, to that, to that space is, is mine to bear. And I'm to do nothing to at least as much as I lose as I can, because we all have flaws yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. to, to step away from that. So I don't try extra hard. I'm, I'm not, so sometimes you, so you have to try hard. I'm like, no, I don't try extra hard. I just, I'm yeah. just doing what I, what I should be doing. But I also am aware that when I slip up or if I slip up, there is sometimes like, Oh, there it is. And it's not everybody. It's a very small subset of people. So it's a hard bear, burden to bear. What, uh, Boy, there's a lot of places I could go now just from you talking. About <laughs> Sorry, buddy. A lot, of, a lot of stories come to mind and experiences. My wife and I, a few years ago, we were doing a partnership with another. When I worked at Cal State Fullerton, we had a, a bank, City National Bank, that was our title sponsor for our family business Hall of Fame event we did. And the executives came to that first event in 2016 and something that we did there they loved, apparently. And they asked us to come in and do some events for them. Uh, at the bank beyond family business. And it's like, I didn't really know what they meant until I went and we sat down with them up in LA and we were sitting with their senior executive team, their VP of diversity, equity, and inclusion, Karen Clark. Uh, and we're all just kind of sitting around a room trying to figure out what this is going to look like. And I don't really remember who came up with the idea, but the end result of the meeting was our little foundation that my wife and I started, the Heart Leadership Center. We were <laughs> going to be running a Black Business Leader Hall of Fame for City National Bank in LA. And it, it, I was excited about it. It's like, okay, well, what am I doing running this event? You might say, obviously. But I, I leading up to, what I'm leading up to is at the first, we did it a few times, but the first time we did it, Melody Hobson, who is the um, chairman of Estee Lauder on the board for Starbucks, 
married to George Lucas, famous, you know, movie producer and so forth. Black woman, beautiful black woman. She gets up and she's speaking to this audience of about 400 people. Most are African-American. Um, mm -hmm. And she talks a lot about being a victim. And she talks a lot about mm -hmm. giving and taking. And the, and the example she said is she said, hold up your iPhone or your phone. Look at the last 10 people that called you. Did you answer those calls or did you not answer those calls? And if you didn't, why not? And mm -hmm. is the why not because they were calling you because they wanted something or they were asking something or they were kind of a suck rather than a than a, a, a taker rather than a giver, I think might have been her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and she talked about that victimness and she talked about, you know, just uh, I'm 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 talking myself into a hole here a little bit and I'm going to pull myself back out. But when you mentioned being a black man and the <laughs> stereotypes and, you know, things of that nature, how do you overcome that? I, I'm a 59 year old white male who's lived in a very privileged neighborhood my entire life. I've had privilege my entire life. I've never felt oppressed or judged or, you know, anyone looked at me because of my skin color or my background for even a second of my life with any kind of judgment. How have you overcome? You're a great dad. You're a great father. You're a great CEO. You're a man mm -hmm. of influence, obviously, as we've talked about. Talk about if that's even been a challenge for you. And if so, how you've overcome it. I'm going to be completely you know I mean, I'm being completely honest yeah it's been a challenge but it not hasn't been the challenge that i think others have faced yeah and it, i i don't know why i'm not i'm not gonna there's, there's no there's no formula for for yeah. for, for for this um and, and i'm sure there's a formula right but there's in my mind there's no formula I, I can tell you that here's here's what i believe um has been set on me and my heart in that space to be as authentic as, as authentic as I possibly can. Yeah. As grounded as I possibly can can. And I've learned over time to let things just roll off my back. Yeah. Right. So, you know, God says don't worry, right? So if God says don't worry, he also says don't carry those burdens. Right. Right. So there are times when you have things that go wrong in your life and, and as a as a as a person of color, there are things that go wrong in your life that are out of your control that someone else controls and your response to that, which is the word responsibility mm -hmm. bro broken down, right? Your ability to respond, right? Ability to respond. It, it, it can either, it can diminish the, the negative effects or it can heighten the negative effects. Mm -hmm. right. So first of all, try to diminish negative effects. One of the ways you have to do that. And, and one of the ways you live your life is I'm a member of the human being race, just like you are. Yeah. First. Two, we all have flaws. Yeah. We all got flaws. I got flaws. I'm sure you have flaws. Absolutely. Others have flaws. Yep. So recognize that those with flaws will make flawed decisions and they will do things. And God calls us to also forgive. Yeah. Right. So forgiving sometimes isn't forgiving. Sometimes forgiving is forgetting. Yeah. Right. Yep. Forgetting. Doesn't mean you shouldn't fight for yourself and advocate for yourself. Right. And I'll tell you that story later, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> That's not for this time. <laughs> um, but at the same time, proving to yourself and to others, and not proving in a sense like I'm going to prove to you that I am. Right. But proving, proving on a daily basis that you're worthy, you are loved, you deserve. And that you are going to make a difference in the world, wherever that may be. And that difference in the world does not have to be, I'm going to save the world. I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to, you don't have to put the, the conditions on it. Right. <laughs> right. Those conditions are, that, yeah. yeah, we all have some conditions, but you don't have to put the conditions on it. Set yourself up for failure too. If you put those conditions and you fall short, then you just beat yourself up. Right. Which we all do. Well, yeah. Failure is failure is inevitable in my life. We, yeah. we, we, I tell my team members, if you're not failing, you you're not trying I'm hard trying. enough. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like, some of them some of them don't understand that. Like, what yeah. do you mean? I'm like, well, if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. You're not reaching, you're not stretching yourself. One. Now, catastrophic failure is a different conversation. We, we yeah. don't we don't want to talk about that. Um, but as far as me or other people of color or people who are not of color. Yeah. People who are low income, who are feeling marginalized. My my recommendation is to everyone is live who you are and be the best you can be the best person you are with what you have in front of you. And you're going to be all right. Yeah. 
I love that. I don't know if I answered your question. No, I think, I think you did. Absolutely. And you, get, <laughs> and, and you triggered more. And I haven't even gotten to my, I have a script, but I'm not really calling it a script. It's just bullet points in case we get stuck and we're, we're not going to get stuck. This is you and I can talk all day long about really great things. Two part question. And I, I've yeah. been coached by a lot of, I've, I've had a lot of coaching on podcasting over the last few years. And one thing mm. I've been told is don't ask very many two part questions, but I do it a lot anyway. Because I like to get you to think of in terms of, okay, I'm going to answer this question, but how does that tie to the next one as well? How has your faith, obviously you're a man of faith, and we're going to talk about that a lot here today, um, mm -hmm. as am I. How has your faith made you a better leader, and how has your leadership made you better in your faith? Okay, so how has my faith made me a better leader? Um, one, my faith around when I started actually reading the Bible. So for 30 years, 35 years, probably. Yeah, probably about 35 years. I was, a, I've been a, I've been a Christian all my life. Okay. Right. Grew up in first AME church is the first African method, Methodist Episcopal church in LA yeah. um, with my grandparents and my, and my family, primarily my grandparents. I've been in church, altar boy, <laughs> it, all kinds of stuff. Part of your DNA practically. Yeah. Part of the YMCA going to camp. Um, yeah. So all these things. So there, there's this, there's this faith that happens, but when I got in a Bible uh, Bible study group with a, with other with other Christian men, we actually started reading the Bible and the details on life, <laughs> and the details on on and when I say details, I mean the details, the details on life, the details on instructions on how to live your life, the details and instructions on how to manage your business, the details on instructions on how to how to be with people, um, hold people accountable, are immense. Yeah. Now. Most people don't know that because they haven't read those sections of the Bible. Right. Yes, Jesus was born. Yes, Abraham brought us out of the. <laughs> yes, the tablets were made. Yes, she ate the apple. <laughs> right. Stories that we all know from from our ch child years. Yeah. But the stories about being and doing and business yeah. are baked into baked into scripture so in that i started recognizing and understanding and seeing more and more about how the instructions of godly life and godly business exist in the bible and i, I just i just adopted it yeah right it wasn't like okay, I'm gonna do that. it's like right because that's what i'm supposed you to start do realizing how those things <laughs> tie into and and influence you uh, and there's that word influence again influence us in leadership right so those instructions exist and then the pivot, the the piece that I learned before I started reading the Bible was servant leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. Which is, I got, know, uh, I have that book on my desk, the servant. Oh, leadership there you go. <laughs> by Ken Blanchard. If you don't have this, I'm going to get you a copy. I do not have that particular one, right. but I, but I, I understand it really well. And, yeah. it, but I'd love to read it. Um, it again, who washed the feet of the of the of the disciples? Right, and, exactly, and. and 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 when we read that part of the Bible or, or hear that part of the Bible, we go, oh, that's really nice of him. It's like, no, 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 yeah. no, no. These these people were walking in the desert doing the hard work and their feet hurt. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Their, their feet were tired. If there was yeah. anything that would make them stop other than the pain of of, of healing people and talking to people, it, it was literally the pain of their feet. Yeah. They didn't have the Air Jordans like we have today, and they're not walking a couple of miles like we are today. They're walking dozens and dozens every day in sandals. In sandals on dirt and yeah. gravel and and all these things. Well, so what does that mean, right? What does that mean to wash the feet of your of your team? Which no one thinks about that, right? Right. When we do, we do, right? We do, but we don't think about it of, of like, I'm washing your feet, not because... I need to wash your feet because I need to wash your feet to show you that I love you. I need to wash your feet because you know what? I haven't walked that far. Mm -hmm. I have better yeah. shoes. Sometimes I have better shoes on. Yep. Sometimes I have more privilege, which allows me to even not have to walk at all. And my reserve of energy, my ability to help you be successful is at that point in time, much more important than anything else there is because you are doing the good work. Right. So if you're doing the good work and I'm just the leader in front, 
staying up getting all the praise and getting able to tell the story but i don't recognize that the 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 feet of my team members who are struggling and trying to battle through are weary and i ignore that now this is the simple for simplified version of that conversation mm-hmm. but and i ignore that yeah and i'm actually ignoring who produces i'm ignoring who makes it happen i'm ignoring the the ones that i count on to be as successful as they possibly can be. And that is biblical. Yeah. It it it, it is anchored in it. <laughs> because yep. when you get to the point to where whether you're a CEO of a small nonprofit and you're and you're doing everything and you should have your feet washed, or you're the CEO of one of the largest nonprofits in the country and you don't even know that people exist. <laughs> right. Being able to balance between that and actually have servant leadership and be able to like get into the smallness of people is what makes you successful. Can you give an example? I wrote down the words washing your people's feet just now. Can you give an example of the figurative way that a leader can wash his or her people's feet in the, in, in the day-to-day workplace? Today, right now, today in this, in this neighborhood, in this, in this, this environment, one of the ways you can wash someone's feet, and this is anybody's feet. Yeah is to stop, look at them, talk to them, and hear them, and know them. I love right? That. It's it's simple. And I don't do it well. I, I don't do it very well. I, I, I do it to a level that I possibly can. And, and I'm, I'm not saying if you, have a, if you have 400 employees, you're not going to wash everybody's feet. Yeah. But you, but you better be washing the people that, you, that directly report to you. Sure. You better be having them wash the feet of the people who report to them. <laughs> yeah. Right? So in, in, for, for me, it is see people, be, be recognize when people are on the edge because there are telltale signs when people are on the edge. Yeah. When they're tired, they're burnt out, they're stressed out, they have something going on, they cough, like just a, just a regular cough. Like you've coughed three times. Are you sick? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. feeling a little sick. Okay, you should go home. Right. Well, I have too much to do. I hear you. I understand that you have too much to do. But if you keep coughing, you're, you're going to be out for a week. Why don't you go just at rest tonight and we'll see you again yes. tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, go home. I'll give you an example. Uh, we have a new employee who started uh, a couple weeks ago. And she, it was on, it was Monday of this, was it this week? Yeah, this week, Monday. She was working and on Tuesday I saw her and she had a crick in her neck. She could barely move. I mean, like. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, right. And at the end of the day, like everyone's like, oh, you take care of yourself, get some rest. And I, and I looked at her and I go, you know, you can take the day off tomorrow. You have sick, you can take sick time. And she said, in passing, she was walking out and she's yeah. like, you go, you know, you have sick time. You could take it. She goes, no, I only get sick time after my first 90 days. I go, not here, you don't. Know. Yeah, you've got it now. Yeah, you got it now. And she looked at me, she goes, you could see the look on her face like, oh. I could take tomorrow off. I'm like, yeah. And yeah. if you need to, you should. So you can right. take care of yourself. And you could see this 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 look of one shock and, and, and amazement that the you CEO saw says. Yeah. I saw her. Yeah. That I could tell her that she needs to take a time off. And then I went to her supervisor and said, hey, reinforce tomorrow that she call her and say, if you're not feeling well tomorrow, you can stay home. Yeah. Right. That's what that's that that's just seeing seeing yeah. seeing them. Those are some examples of where. No, I like that a lot because so many people. Advice. You know, I, it's funny because you know you mentioned Charles Antis earlier. Several years ago, he gave me the five minute journal, and I've been writing in that. I, I miss days, not perfect, but I, I strive to do it most days. But one of the things that I've always strived to do, I used to work at USC, and I take the train into work um, yeah. many days out of the week, not every day, but. There were days where I would make a conscious decision. Okay, today I'm going to smile at three people on the train. And it, number one, it makes me kind of sad to think that I had to make that a conscious plan. But there are days when I get my nose in a book and I'm reading or I'm talking to the one person next to me or I'm closing my eyes and taking a nap. But if I tell myself before I get on the train, I'm going to smile at three people. There are story after there's story after story after story of, of conversations that I've had with people because I made that decision to look at someone in the eyes and smile at them, not even say anything. It could be the woman or the guy across the aisle from me in the train and I just look and we just acknowledge people want to be acknowledged and you don't have to, you know, 
literally or figuratively even wash their feet just to acknowledge that they exist and 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 how i felt about myself and about my god in in those moments when i would look at someone and smile at them and i, I noticed it yesterday i made that decision yesterday when you know, i saw you at the pass keys breakfast mm -hmm. so i had that thought when i walked in i'm gonna make eye contact with and have a conversation with someone that i don't know today seems easy to do in a room full of a couple hundred people and you and i we walk up and hug people and we go to these networking things every day multiple times a day in our jobs but when i approached it yesterday with i'm going to do this i walked in the door and the first person i saw was somebody i've never you know they recognized my name i recognized their name from the name tags but we never had a conversation and we shook hands and it's almost as if he had done the same thing and uh, i'm going to smile at a stranger basically because we looked at each other we smiled and then probably four times over the course of that 90 minutes we were together, we passed each other and gave each other a hug or exchanged business cards. And we've already emailed today. You know, it's just one of those things where just making that conscious decision to acknowledge somebody else can really move a mountain for sure. So you, know, you mentioned the YMCA. Yeah. Um, I used to work at this YMCA um, actually with Tim Strau. So yeah. Tim and I, Tim Strau and I worked together at the YMCA. He was the exec director yeah. and I was the associate executive. I, I tell the story pretty regularly, so I'm telling it because I tell it pretty regularly. I would, I would, I was working the the fitness facility, you know, the pool and the basketball gym and the fitness and everything else. And I, I'd, I'd come walking down the pathway, and this guy came walking down the pathway every day, almost the same time. Like he could have worn worn a path yeah. in his path, and every day I'd say good morning, because that was that was what I would say to people. I'm, I'm the exact, I'm the associate exec. I acknowledge everybody as I pass by. Yeah. And every day I'd say good morning. How you doing? He go terrible. Hmm. I must have said heard him say terrible. I, I mean, I can't even count how many times. Yeah. And finally, one day I said, "Why are you always terrible?" And he stopped. And he goes, "Oh, you heard me." Yeah. And I said, "Yeah, I heard you. You say you're terrible all the time. You say you're terrible every morning." He goes, "Yeah, most people when they hear me say terrible, they go, oh, good,' and they keep walking." Yeah. And I go, you "Didn't no, really you hear say it." Yeah. And here, and I go, no, you say you're terrible every day. Like, it, I'm finally, I'm like, I needed to find out why you're always terrible. <laughs> yeah, what's going and on? What's going on? And he intentionally would say terrible until someone read get a reaction. To, to, yeah, someone actually yeah. heard him say, I'm terrible. If someone walks up to you and there's a child and says, I'm terrible, you should stop and go, what, what are you up? terrible about? Yeah. Right? You should pause right that minute and go, well, whoa, whoa, what's terrible? Yeah. What's going on? That's that's how we should live our lives. Like you're right. You walk into a room and, and yeah. instead of someone saying, Hi, my name is blah 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 blah. Here's my business card and I want your business. I'm like, hi, what's your name? What do you do? Yeah. Exactly. Primarily as a mechanism to keep yeah. them from asking me what I do. But yeah, there you go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> deflect, right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to I don't want to talk about me anymore. I want to hear about you. Let's hear about you. I heard a podcast the other day. I listened to the Good Life Project by a guy named Jonathan Fields, who I've been listening to for 10 years. And uh, he interviewed a woman or um, you know, this is a guy I've heard him two days in a row. Yesterday was a woman on another topic on aging, which is appropriate because I'm turning 60 soon. So aging is on my mind. I'm only three but, years behind you. There you go. We're, 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 I'll, I'll race you. I think I'll, I think I'll keep this little gap. But, let's let's um, keep it up. Yeah. But the one a couple of days ago was how to connect quickly and deeply with people was the title mm. of the podcast. And one of the things that really struck me, and I shared this on my podcast the other day with Jessica Hubbard of Casa Youth Shelter. So if anybody's listening to these podcasts sequentially, you heard me tell this story already on the one that I did with Jessica the other day. But when people are talking to you, and I think about this gentleman that you passed by every day and asked how he's doing, and he says, terrible, that there's three things that people want when you're talking to them. And there might be 30 things, but he identified three. Listen, as you're listening to somebody and they're talking, are they talking to you because they just want to be heard? Are they talking to you because they want to be hugged? Mm -hmm. Or are they talking to you because they want to be helped? Mm -hmm. and, you know, sometimes it's all three. Sometimes it's just, you know, how you doing? Fine. Keep walking, you know, and they just want to acknowledge and see you. But sometimes they need a hug, whether it's a literal hug or a figurative hug. You know, something's going wrong and I need a listening ear. Or they want to be helped. You know, hey, I'm going through a problem. Can you help me fix this? You mm -hmm. know, and so it's only been 48 hours or so since I listened to that episode, but I've been trying to use that in my conversations here at home, as well as in conversations at work. You know, does this person want to be heard? Do they want to be hugged or do they want to be helped? Yeah. And um, it's, so it's helped me a little bit, hopefully just, you know, and I'll continue to think that way as I'm talking to people, 
And I think that, you know, have you watched um, the series, The Chosen? I'm watching it now. It's okay. uh, it, re- it reminds me of the feet. Uh, so that in right. I thought of that scene as well. That scene, that scene where Mary watches Jesus. I don't hope I'm not ruining it for anyone. Right. That scene where Mary watches. Well, if you read the New Testament, Jesus. you know it's coming. You know it's coming, but no, 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 no. The when when he was doing the healings, yeah, and he comes back to the, it, it was so powerful. Yeah, he was doing the healings, and and by the way, in my in my Bible study group, we talk about the disciples as the bunch, the biggest bunch of idiots we've ever seen. We've ever <laughs> right, and the chosen boys that out too. <laughs> yeah, these guys are great. Like it's really clear. We're like, oh, we were actually yeah. right about that. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus comes straggling back in, exhausted. And, and this, to this, I think, I think all three of these, right. Mm-hmm. He was heard by Mary. Yeah. He was hugged by Mary with it. With, she, she greeted him. She washed yes. his feet and then she helped him into bed so he could relax. So he could be ready the next day. And yeah. I, that's what reminded me about the, the, when I, when I made the connection about servant leadership, it was that scene. Yeah. Which Absolutely. by the way, you told me to watch chosen, which we were watching that, that helped me kind of go, that is what servant leadership is. Yeah, that's that, what I was, that is it. We've been watching. My wife and I watched all the ser- the first three seasons here at home, but now season four is only available in the theaters. Yeah. And we've gone each Sunday that it's been released, and it's been. I know there's controversy, and there may be people who are strong faith people who don't like the chosen, and I understand. But I, I like it. I like that it gets me thinking about Jesus. It gets me thinking about. You know, how to be a better leader and a better servant, a better human being, a better man of faith. So I haven't even gotten past my first question was to find the word influence. I, I haven't even heard you talk <laughs> about South County Outreach yet. Tell us what That's it is you do. And I know I love, I love what you do because it is very biblical, obviously, you know, in that you've done the, to this to the least of my brethren. You've done it to me. You know, you're yep. feeding people. So talk about South County Outreach. What and uh, well, then I have a question I'm going to ask you. So tell us what it is, and then I'm going to ask my next question. Sure. So South County Outreach was started by Ray Havard um, more than 30 years ago, and um, he started out with because he started realizing that people in his neighborhood in Lake Forest were hungry and needed some help. So he started a food pantry, like lots of nonprofits have started right out of his out of his, out of his garage. Um, that's that. That's what I believe it is. He wrote a book, so I got. I, I need to confirm that. But still, yeah. Um, and today, um, we are still on that same mission of of hunger and homeless prevention. Um, keyword being prevention, and that's where we are. That's where we are leaning in right now to try to figure out how do we become that nonprofit, or how do we continue to be that nonprofit who is preventing people from being hungry and preventing people from falling into homelessness. And so we're on a mission right this minute to ensure that people in our neighborhoods right now, South County, but we, we plan on expanding people are in our neighborhood, understand that their neighbor is the one who's coming to get the services Hmm. or that they are the neighbor who needs the services, but don't recognize that those services are available. And why do I say that? Family of four making under a hundred thousand dollars is in poverty. Yeah. Right. Now, people on the podcast might go, I don't know anyone in family of four making over hundred under a hundred thousand dollars. You do. You do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, you do. Now the problem is that is South County. It's right. it's Orange County, it's it's California, and that we don't walk around with a moniker saying, I make less than right. Right. Um I'm not, I'm not going to call this guy out. I hope he never sees this, but a uh, tow truck guy picks up my, my, my car the other day. He asked me, what do I do? I tell him, he goes, wow, well, I wish I, I wish I could use that. And I go, I wish I could, I could have something like that. I go, how much money do you make? Tell him what's how much money you make. He told me how many people was it? I said, you qualify. He goes, yeah. I qualify. Come on over. Yeah. Come on. And I go, and exactly like, come on over. Yeah. He goes, I can just come over. I'm like, absolutely. You can. Right. Absolutely. You can. Like, yeah. so that's who we are. Now I'm not explaining it to the to the depths. No, I get it though, because I think a lot of us think this is for people who are on the streets and have nothing. But you know, it's the guy or the gal who's working full time, maybe two jobs, bringing in fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollars a year, which you know still puts you in the upper three percent of the world population in income, but not here. Well, not here. A hundred thousand dollars. 
right? So when you think you're making hundred thousand dollars, most people think I'm doing okay. Yeah. Right. Now, if you have not, if you're by yourself, yeah, you're doing yeah. great. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Once you start feeding mouths, or you got other bills and things like that, it it adds up, and it adds up. Uncle and, takes his, and benefits take theirs, and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it starts. It starts to get harder. So, uh, so for us, it is really about how do we help our neighbors help our neighbors? How do we ensure that people aren't suffering? And we have a vision. We believe that no one goes, should go to bed hungry or without a place to call home. Let me, let me unpack that again. No one yeah. should go to bed hungry or without a place to call home. Now, here's the thing. That's not our mission statement. That's our vision. Right. When you, when you hear that and you stop, if you were to hear me, you go, oh, that sounds great. I go, oh, no, no, you didn't hear me. Because most people would stop and go, excuse me? Mm -hmm. You should stop and say, excuse me? No one should go to bed hungry. Right. Or well, or a place to call home. Now, politics aside, policy, politics, right. forget all that stuff. Do you do you believe that no one should go to bed hungry? Do you believe that no one should go to bed without a roof over their heads? And the answer should always be yes. Absolutely. I believe that. How is a different conversation. Right. <laughs> step one, agree with this. Because if you don't, there is no step two. There is no step two. Yeah. I know we talk about the Bible a lot. Yeah. But so Jesus is standing there. He's got 5,000 people. And what is he worried about? Hungry. He's worried about their soul. Right? Yeah. Their you know souls. Really and then he realizes, you guys are getting hungry. You guys are getting hungry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. That's not my responsibility yeah. to feed you. You should have you should have brought some lunch with you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where's your where's your um Scooby Doo, you know, lunch box? Yeah, lunch bill. Thermos. Right? Yeah. Second, I don't remember the scripture off the top of my head, but knock at the door in the middle of the night. Um, I have no place to sleep, or I need some bread. Do you answer the door to for your neighbor, or do you keep the door locked for safety? Hmm. Now I'm not suggesting that anyone in South County should open the door to someone they don't know in the middle of the night. Right. Or leave your door unlocked. Yeah. Or leave your door unlocked. But what I am saying is that if your neighbor knocks on your door or you don't knock on your neighbor's door when you recognize that they are hungry or there's something going wrong, you're not a neighbor. Yeah. And we choose these neighborhoods because we want great neighbors. We want great neighbors, we want great neighborhoods, we want great schools, and then we're not great neighbors. Yeah. Because yeah. all we care about is ourselves. Right? I mm -hmm. love that. Mm -hmm. That's not it. <laughs> yeah, like they say, if you want to have a friend, be a friend. You want to have great neighbors, be a great neighbor. Be a great neighbor. So in that, that's what we do. For, for us, it is, we are, we are a place for neighbors to be able to have dignity and respect Absolutely. as it relates yeah did think yeah disney dignity and respect as it relates to their their food consumption in other words agency over what they choose and there's lots of nonprofits to do that we do it really well um and then how do we help those who need to stay in their homes stay in their homes through rental assistance utility assistance and case management in other words talking through people how do they how do they manage their money or how do they make sure they stay housed those are the two key concepts that we have yeah. so all of that being said what do you love about your job um, you do you love your job because that's obvious <laughs> I, I love i love every door that god has brought that open has opened for me even even the doors he opened for me, I was like, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> that was a that was a pass through. That was a pass through from one door to another. Yeah. Um. You know, I, I'm gonna be happy wherever I'm wherever I'm placed. Yeah. I'm gonna be happy wherever I play. I'm placed, and I'm only placed where God wants me to go. Yeah. What do you? This is a hard question to ask, given the premise of where we are in this conversation, mm -hmm. but I'm going to ask it anyway. What are you good at? What do you, when you lay down at night and you think about, man, I did pretty good there. What, what, uh, like with me, that if anybody asks me that question, I'm good with people. 
you know, I, I, I don't have much in the way of skill sets. I can't, I can't build a cabinet. I can't, you know, fix my car. I can't, a lot of those things that my wife can do. She's the handy person in this, in this marriage. She can do all that stuff pretty well. I can't, but when it comes down to making relationships and connecting people, I think that's a strength. What, what's, what's Laval? What do you, what do you think you're good at? I, I think I'm, I'm pretty good at that. I'm pretty good at that as, as one, but I, 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 what I'm really, what I'm really good at is I can see the future for the endeavor Hmm. and I can quickly, for the most part, not fully quickly, but I can quickly determine. So where's it going? Yeah. And how do we, and, and, and not how do we get there? Because that changes. Like you're talking about, talking about, if you're talking about 10 years, 20 years of, 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 of work, (laughs) or should we even go there and that's another thing that with that skill set you probably don't spin your wheels doing a lot of things and look back and go oh that was kind of a waste of time yeah we we jettison things that aren't i jettison things that aren't gonna that that aren't getting us where we want to go quickly um i'll give you a quick question quick quick example um when i got south county outreach in june in september i'm talking to our thrift store manager about the the thrift store and i'm talking to him like don't you think you need a bigger place and she goes, well, yeah, we've always wanted a bigger place. We need a bigger place. I go, okay, great. Let's do that. And she said, well, we just put flooring in like back in January, new flooring. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and she goes, well, if we move, then, you know, that flooring, I looked at her and I went, I went, do you want a bigger place or not? Right. <laughs> yeah. Someone else will have the great flooring when they come in. That's all right. Flooring. Yeah, we'll figure out the form. What, what, yeah. what? But so we, so the jettison is, don't let that hang you up. The question is, right. is that what we're supposed to do? We went from, th- we went from being excited about a seven hundred dollar day, <laughs> to being disappointed with a twelve hundred dollar day. Yeah, nice. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yep. So you have to be able to see where we're going, and you're right. You have to be able to see like, no, that's not going to work. Don't do that. I'm I'm good at I'm good at scaling. Also really good at taking what is the problem and 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 understanding the actual problem and then saying what is the potential solution to that problem? Not what's the not what's the incremental gain or what's the right. what's good, you know, we're gonna go from this to this. It's like, okay, this is this is gonna be. I hope this isn't controversial, but when you take the uh, Marriage Equality Act, mm-hmm. when they got to that end zone, that when they were done, people were like, "Oh my God, you're out of business!" And we're like, "They're like, no, no, we've created a skill set that is yeah. available to solve other problems." Right now, I don't think we're gonna solve hunger and homelessness anytime soon, but if we were. And if we did, woohoo, there right. you go, right? Exactly. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. And yeah. everyone in the system is now an expert at solving a problem. You have a job. Yeah. Don't be afraid of solving the problem. No one's going to be mad at you for solving cancer. No one's going to be mad at you for solving homelessness. Right. No one's going to be mad. If, you, if we put every every nonprofit who is working on hunger and homelessness out of business, I don't think there's anyone who's going to be like, hmm, well, how do we do that? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Go after it. Like, look and, and, and not solve the problem with what we think is the obvious solution. Let's really look at what are the things that we need to do to solve this problem? Yeah. And by the way, if it's not solvable, but it's fixable, look at that too, right? Yeah. Because I we've recognized, I know you won't jump in your head, but no, we've, recogni- we've recognized that hunger has and homelessness has been around for millennia. Right. In the Bible, it says poverty, those with poverty will always be among us. The poor will always be among us. Yeah. So if you believe the Bible, that tells you that the poor will always be among us. Okay, so that, what does that mean? Right. So then how do we deal with that? Yeah. What do we do about it? Well, and then also to your point, we might be working towards and making steps towards solving problem X. And maybe we get close to problem X and there isn't a solution, but we can take what we've learned from these steps and solve problem Y. 
Sure can. You know, maybe the problem isn't homelessness. Maybe it's not hunger, but maybe it's, you know, maybe it's my next door neighbor's homelessness and his hunger. Maybe I can take those steps and help him with that. And if I help the one, you know, then maybe he can take that and then he can help the one. So I think what happens is we oftentimes think too big. It's good to think big. Obviously, we want to have big, hairy, audacious goals and be thinking about the big solutions. But sometimes it's that first step. It's that one person. It's that starfish that we throw back in the ocean. Mm. Save, save that one. I might not be able to save the thousand on the beach right now, but I just saved that one. And uh, you know, we used to we used to tell that star for a story almost every summer at camp, YMCA camp, to yeah. all of our kids. We would tell that starfish story every time, and. Yeah. Looking back on it, I was like, that's here it comes. Here comes the start. Yeah, you knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, there's a reason why it's overused because it's it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. So a couple of things. I want to be respectful of your time. We're we're recording this on a Friday at the end of the day. So for those that are watching or listening at some future date, it's 515 on a Friday afternoon. So I want to be respectful of the fact that you've got a, a date with your wife here in a little bit. What what are some of the challenges that you face in your day-to-day with South County Outreach and how can other people get involved and help you out? Well, it's a great question. Um, we are an abundance organization. We, we live with an abundance mindset um, uh, and an abundance um, uh, language base. So, when you say how can people help me, that's that's part of that abundance conversation. But it 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 comes it makes us kind of go like this, like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm, I I do I can answer that question because we've 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 seen that where abundance exists, that um, others come, that the abundance causes the ability for that abundance to be be consumed. I'm gonna give you a quick example. Um, we've created such a, we've created such a logistic system within our food program that we can take pallets of food. Now there's, there's very few nonprofit pantries that can take pallets of food Yeah, because you got to get it, you got to store it, you got to produce it, you got to, and you got to push it out, right? Which is right. pushing it out is normally not the hard part, but yeah, all those other pieces. Um, we got four pallets of onions today. Mm. And I saw these four pallets three years ago. I would have been like, Oh my God, well, what do we, how they're going to go bad? What are we going to do yeah. today? I'm like, Oh, great. Got three pallets of onions. Yep. Right. So the, so where can people, how can people help us? It's not food. Yeah. It, it is not bringing me more food. America is. And, and, and by the way, if you want to bring me food, I'm, I'm happy to accept. You're it. not saying no, <laughs> but it's not the thing you're going out there knocking on doors trying to get. We're, we're happy to have it. We're happy to have the engagement of food. That is a, that is a, that is a, that is a blessing to the community by all means. That's, if that's your give, we're happy about it. Yeah. Um, America, the America piles under enough food to feed the hungry, the hungriest amongst us. Yeah. And, and America takes that same amount of food and feeds it to the pigs and the cows and the goats. Right. Um, at a, at, a, at a pretty healthy level. And there's reasons for that. I'm not blaming the farmers. There's, there's a reason for that. Right. So for right now, for us, what we've seen in the abundance is that um, we do need some help financially. Yeah. Um, and that's because we've decided that we're going to open up a second pantry in our neighborhood. And we have a, we have efforts and, and ideas to open up a third and a fourth and a fifth pantry. And those pantries are not food. Those pantries are brick and mortar. They're gas. They're electricity. They're yeah. they're they're Cost insurance. Business, yeah, yeah. So so we need some help to we need some help to stand up mm-hmm. those places where no one goes to bed hungry or a place to call home. Yeah. Right? So we we need we need some we need some support there. That's not been our mo. That's not been our conversation. We have not been saying, "Hey, send us money." Yeah. Um. Today we're like, okay, we we need some financial support because we believe that we're on the cusp of of really solving some of this hunger problem. But in that solving of that hunger problem, and this is the next request, we're looking for volunteers who have a skill set. Mm-hmm. And that skill set is a skill set of loving thy neighbor. 
There you go. Right. Now in the skill set of putting putting things on the shelf. By the way, we need those volunteers too. Sure. But we need a skill set of loving thy neighbor and that that little extra level of skill set of I can talk to you about your situation and help you be successful. So we're looking for former nurses, we're looking for former case managers, we're looking for former teachers, we're looking people who can sit with someone and with love and care and, and empathy and and some understanding of the the plight of po- people in poverty to be able to help them move to a new level, which is the reason why, which is our idea of solving the problem. Our idea of solving the problem is how many people can we help get out of line? How many people can we help not need our hom- homeless prevention work in case management at some point in time, time in the future? How many people can we help figure out how to, to have their bills be in line to where they have enough money at the end of the day to take care of their basic needs and not need our homeless prevention and not need our, home, our, our, our rental assistance? And how can we help people get to the point to where they never need it in the first place? Got it. Yeah. Right. Which means that we have to start getting to people who aren't even in line yet, who don't even know they're going to get. Right. So how, prevention how do again. Get that? that prevention piece. Yeah. Right. Which for us, we think is aged out foster youth, transitional age youth, um, young college students who are just getting started out, who are not who are not necessarily in a high growth field. Um, how, how do we help them not get in line in the first place? Yeah. Do you ever hear the so, poem, The Ambulance Down in the Valley? No, I'm not. So I'll send it to you. And um, I'm, I can't quote the poem, but it's one I've known for 40 years. And it's, uh, there's this town and this um, cliff at the end of town and people are constantly falling off the cliff and dying or getting, you know, hurt, you know, badly injured at the bottom of the cliff when they fall. And so, you know, the politicians in the town decide, you know, what we need to do is we need to put an ambulance in the bottom of the valley. So when they fall, we can rush them to the hospital. And then an engineer comes along and says, well, what if we put a fence at the top of the cliff so people won't fall? You know, it's that prevention. You know, how can, what do we can, what can we do? Like right now, we, we spend so much of our time as human beings and in the nonprofit world, I think sometimes depending on what the cause is, or even just in our, our day-to-day living with ambulances in the bottom of the valley all the time trying to you know okay let's well let's rush them off and fix them up well maybe we should think about prevention maybe we should try to keep them from falling and so i like that i, I think of that ambulance down in the valley poem as you talk about that let's prevent uh-huh. people who aren't even in the line yet yeah people in the line we're going to have the ambulance at the bottom of the valley for them but what can we do to keep people from the line yeah, you know, you, we talked about the YMCA. I know we've hit it on a couple of times, but the, that's where my prevention conversation comes in. For those who know the YMCA, the majority of YMCA programs are on the prevention side of, of the ledger. You don't hear YMCAs who open food pantries, who are doing homeless prevention. Now, you right. have some who are deal, who are working with their, their low-income sure. clients to do that work, and there's some secondary work that happens, but when I think about the Y guides and princess programs, that's where the father daughter program where what dads are, are take their daughters, their sons, and they go camping or they go do activities together, you know, on a weekend or a weekday or something like that. And they're in, in those small groups of other dads. Um, so, so connected, right. I used to run that program. What, what was happening there? It was creating a bond and a relationship with your child that most men don't create on their own because the caregiving part is for the most part seen as a female thing. Right. Right. Now there's plenty of dads who, who are not sure. that, right? We're talking the stereotype stereotype, but for a good number of dads, yeah, that program brought them so close to their kids that the relationship that they had with them when they got older was so strong that it rivaled the relationship of the child to the mother. Wow. Right? Now, it didn't replace the race for the child and the mother. Right. But it, it rivaled the relationship of the child and the mother, which is a great thing. Absolutely. Right? What does that prevention mean? That means that when a young man looks at what his father did 
as a caregiver and as a lover of the family, he got a picture in his mind of what a positive male relationship is. Yeah. So when he became a male father, that he had a clearer understanding yep. of what it meant to be a positive, loving relationship to their child. Yeah. Right. It's hard to hurt your child when you understand what a positive, loving relationship looks like, feels like. Yeah. Right. You you can take a whole bunch of other things and put the same put the, you can, yeah. YMCA camp, camp, uh, swimming lessons. <laughs> uh, you can put them all in that bucket of this is what is what does it mean to be in community. This is what it means to be healthy. This is what it means. All of those are prevention methods that if you learn how to be healthy as a young child, as a as an adolescent or as a young adult, or even as an older adult, that means that you have less adverse actions later on. Yeah. Right? Start early. Yeah. That's yeah, what we want to do. If you tell someone who's, who's been blind from birth, the sky is blue. That's just a concept to them. They can't put it in their mind what blue looks like. You know, I, I had a chance to serve in a prison ministry at the Chino Men's Prison for a few years. Mm. And we, we would never ask the men, why are you here? What's your last name? Are you guilty or innocent? Because they're all innocent, you know, all innocent. But um, the men who would volunteer to us, you know, why they were there, you know, as you get into conversation, nine times out of 10 and probably 10 out of 10, I mean, almost 10, nine and a half times out of 10, there was no male role model. They didn't know what being a man was supposed to be because they didn't have anybody show them. And so that's that preventative measure. And that's something that, um, you know, as fathers, you and I, you know, and grandpas, we, you know, I've got grandkids, you're getting there, mm -hmm. you know, but as, as parents, we, we need to, I think the number one thing we can do as parents, especially as dads is emulate the behavior that we want our children to, to see. And yeah, not just our kids, but other kids and other, you know, other you know, you've going back to that word that we started the conversation on today of influence, mm -hmm. you know, that, that unintentional influence. There are people watching us all the time. There's always somebody that wants to catch us doing something wrong and then point it out and shout it from the mountaintop. You know, look what this Christian man did, you know, but uh, when we're doing good stuff, no one's out there saying, hey, look what this guy did. You know, not that we're doing it for that reason, but, you know, we're influencing people every day with our words, with our with our nonverbal. We walk into a room. They see how we interact. If you walked into that Paskey's breakfast yesterday, grumpy and didn't say anything to anybody and just walked over to a table and sat down and got your coffee and your breakfast and just sat there and then left, you would have impacted a lot more people than you think. Oh, people are yeah. like, are you, I, I can see Dude, what's up with Laval? Yeah. Are yeah. you okay? <laughs> yeah. And you didn't say anything to anybody. You didn't, you didn't damage anybody's day, but you didn't make anybody's day either. So yeah, there's those unintentional consequences of, of influence that we don't even pay attention to. How do people reach you? They've heard the podcast today. They like what you're talking about. They'd like to get involved. What's the best way to reach you and to and to and begin that process? So for if you, if you want to help South County Outreach be more successful, um, uh, right now it is info at s c o s is a sat cat s and sam cat o is an Oscar dash oc.org okay um that that way you that way you bypass me because i'm not gonna help you <laughs> yeah there you go it'll get, it'll get right to the people that need to do something right let's get you let's get you where you need to be. come to you um, i might sit for a while yeah or volunteer at um yeah. seo-oc. If, if you if you want to connect with me if you want to talk to me if you want to you know, want to want to be engaged uh, uh, the best way to do is it's linkedin so yeah. look me up on linkedin send me a note saying you saw the podcast there you go right send me a note saying top of them, yeah yeah, that, that way I know that you're not just trying to get me to buy my insurance or you, you, you want go. me to you, you want me to sell me. Yeah, I may I may even I may even do that, too. But just yeah. I, I know that you're actually interested in what we're happening in. I meet with I meet with most people. Yeah, so do I. So do I. Yeah. At least at least once I'll have a conversation with anybody. So yeah. and we'll put all your contact information for you and for South County Outreach in the show notes on YouTube, as well as all the audio channels where we'll post this uh, early next week. So anybody watching or listening, will will have that information at your fingertips to reach my good friend Laval here. Mm. A lot of things we can still talk about. Is there anything I, I, I hate asking? These well, let's just questions. do it. I mean, we don't have to do it now, but let's just do it. Yeah, just we'll, do just it. Part, we'll do a part two. 
Um, what do you like to do when you're not, you know, when you're not running South County outreach and, you know, in your Bible study and, you know, you're obviously, I, I, I know who you are, but tell, tell the world a little bit about you that maybe most people don't know. So right now, what I like to do, what I want to do on a pretty consistent basis is uh, I want to entertain in my backyard mm. and that would include my big green egg smoker, um, my barbecue grill and my black top uh uh flat tops uh grill that makes some incredible bacon and eggs Ooh. um it, it also this tomorrow no. <laughs> bacon, bacon and eggs yeah. carne asada you know like you know do that nice. and then in a, a, a huge table that seats 12 in our backyard that my wife and i made during during COVID. Cool. and just get people together awesome that's one two is uh, i love tinkering with building something new out of something old um a fence post is a is a is a welcome sign a, a piece of metal that looks like it's it should be thrown away as a is a planter so mm. taking that and creating something new out of it um, whenever i possibly can um and then finally it is golfing with my friends who put up with my terrible golf game um right here. Yeah. And, and, and now I'm, 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 I'm endeavored to play pickleball with my wife um, who wants to play pickleball more often. So figuring out how to become a better pickleball player. Nice. Wow. You, you, uh, you hit on a lot of the things. I mean, I, I heard a lot of things that I have in common with you there and some things that I don't at all. And we'll leave that for another conversation. But one of the things that I heard the most is you see potential in things, you know, the old fence, mm -hmm. boasts the piece of metal and what it can become. I see that with you with people as well. Mm -hmm. that's a, a big part you see the you, you look at a person and you think of what that person could become and you see their potential and i think that there's a, a really strong analogy to you know rescue south county outreach outreach is all about rescue it's all about prevention it's all about reaching out to the less fortunate and so that fence post that might have been in the in the dump on saturday morning might now be a, a beautiful sign in your front yard and i think that's pretty awesome well well and you have a you have a beautiful gift of seeing the 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 greatness in others. So, I uh, I welcome I thank you so much for seeing the greatness in other people, for your ability to to amplify the voices of people who you believe are doing good work and 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 not just your friends but people you meet. Your ability to attract those who are just uh, glowing members of the society who are givers and just as a as a baseline of the triangle your love of god and your faith in the world and your faith um in what jesus and god has done for us is is more than apparent to me well i thank you for that appreciate that and that's um we we've been given a lot you and i and uh you know it, it's uh it's incumbent on those of us who've received to turn around and give and mm. You know, I was raised by good parents who taught me the value of service. I've married to a woman who has the biggest servant heart of anybody I've ever known. And I'm um, just surrounded by good people. I've been very blessed that I'm surrounded by good people. So I'm going to finish with one last question before you go throw that coat on and take your wife to dinner. It's a question I ask all my guests. So you are guest number 95 on the From the Heart podcast. So I've asked this a few times. Laval Brewer, and you've already answered this question in the last hour, but I'm going to ask it one more time. What's in your heart? Um, my what's in my heart is to make sure that everyone I come into contact with has what they need to be the best they could possibly be. And that and because of that, I will do whatever I can do to help them achieve that that goal, that whoever they best can be, whether they're my children. They're my, my family members or someone I just passed by who needs something to help them be the best they could be right in there, right then and there. 